Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about 10 harmful blood sugar myths that most doctors still believe. The first one is that blood sugar from carbohydrates would be our primary source of energy, that your body depends and can't function without this energy source. So here's how it really works, that if you eat 80% of your calories as carbohydrate, then 80% of your energy will also come from dietary carbohydrates. Whereas if you only ate 10% of your calories from carbohydrates, then 10% of your energy would come from dietary carbohydrates. It's as simple as that. There is no rocket science here. However, if your body is metabolically flexible, then it can switch from one energy source to another. Whereas if you've trained it to only use one, such as carbohydrate, then it might have a hard time switching back and forth. But even if you eat 80% of your calories from carbohydrate, you're still probably only gonna get about 50% of your energy from blood sugar. And the reason is that sugar can turn into fat for storage. So if you eat carbohydrates, you raise your blood sugar, whatever you don't use in this moment has to be stored as glycogen or converted into fat. So a lot of the carbs you eat will get first turned into fat and then we use that energy from fat. But what we have to realize is that equation can't go the other way. We can turn sugar to fat, but we can't turn fat to sugar. We do not have the enzymes as humans to do that. Now, that is a truth with slight modification because you can't turn fat to sugar, but the way that we store fat, the way we store most of the energy on our bodies is as triglycerides. So we store those fatty acids, the fat, on a backbone of glycerol. And that glycerol does turn into glucose, into blood sugar. And that accounts for about 5% of all the energy that you store as fat. So we can't turn fat to sugar, but we still have a few percent of carbohydrates stored in that fat, so to speak. So in terms of blood sugar being the most important energy source, that's a big myth because fat is the better energy source. It runs clean and it provides very, very stable energy. That's why we store our extra energy on the body as fat. Myth number two is that the brain can only use glucose for energy, that it has no other energy sources, and that's simply not true. But I can see where people might start thinking that because on a high carb diet, if you get most of your calories from carbohydrate, then you will have pretty much 100% of the brain's energy from glucose. But a lot of people will now jump to the conclusion that that means the glucose is the preferred fuel because it uses it first. And it's the other way around. It's the exact opposite. That glucose is an emergency. When we have something called hyperglycemia, meaning blood sugar that is too high, that is an emergency. A very high level can put you into a coma. So if we just ate a bunch of carbs and absorbed all that glucose, and it wouldn't take very much even, because on average you have about three to four grams of glucose as blood sugar. So if you increase that tenfold, that means you ate 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate, you absorbed it, but your body didn't bother dealing with it to get it out of there, you would have a blood sugar in the range of a thousand and you would be in a coma. So we can have hyperglycemia, which is an emergency. We could also have hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia, which is high fat or high protein, but those are not emergencies. There is no necessary hormone for the body to release to deal immediately, short term, with high lipids or high protein. But if we have high glucose, that is an emergency and we have to deal with that right now. And that's why in the first few minutes of eating glucose or carbohydrate, we will have 
a response in the form of insulin to deal with that glucose. And that's why we use it first. If on the other hand, you do a low carb diet, you do ketosis or just low carb, now you'll have only about 25% of your energy to the brain coming from glucose. Of course, it's a sliding scale. It's going to start at 100 and work its way down as you eat less carbs, as your body starts burning more fat and producing some ketones. But there's some good evidence that the brain doesn't even need that much glucose because they've done some studies where they had people who fasted for a few days, so they're fat adapted, they're well into producing ketones at a healthy level, which is about three to four millimoles. And these people, they injected them with insulin to try to push the glucose down artificially and see what would happen, to see if they could induce some neurological symptoms of hypoglycemia. But they injected them with insulin and they got their glucose down as low as nine, which is about 10% of a normal level. But even at only 10% glucose, the brain was doing just fine. They had no symptoms at all of hypoglycemia. So what that means is the brain was probably at that point running at 90% of its energy from ketones. So chances are the brain doesn't need glucose at all. It just uses it if it's available. And normally, we would never get as low as 9 or 10 in blood glucose because the body will always have some carbohydrate floating around anyway. Like I mentioned, fat is stored together with some glycerol that will turn into glucose. So we're always going to have some glucose sitting around and that's probably why it levels off around 25%. But here's the problem. When we're told over and over that carbohydrate is the foundation of our energy production, now we start believing other things as well, such as that if you don't eat a breakfast, if you don't eat carbohydrates on a regular basis, if you don't top off your blood sugar, now you won't have any brain energy. You won't have any focus. You can't concentrate. If your kids don't eat cereal for breakfast, they won't make it to lunch. They'll get bad grades and so on. So all these different myths, they're easy to believe because when we eat this way, we also develop a carb dependency. That means you eat some carbohydrates and then your blood sugar goes up the insulin brings it back down, but now as soon as it's low, you fill it back up. So your body learns that there's every two hours, every so often, there's going to be some new carbohydrate. So now you start depending on that type of energy delivery. And now if you miss a meal or if you skip a meal or if you cut back dramatically on your carbohydrates, now your body won't know where to get the energy from because you trained it into only using carbohydrate and blood glucose. Now, if you were to quit cold turkey, like you just go on a fast or you just go straight into keto, what's going to happen is your body is not going to have its usual fuel source, its usual energy source. So you're going to feel really lousy for about two to three days while the body shifts around its metabolic pathways from carbohydrate to fat and it starts making some ketones and then you will be totally fine. But most people never get through the two to three days because they're afraid that something is wrong. Now another way better than cold turkey I believe is just cut down the carbs by maybe 10% per day or every few days and now your body will transition much more smoothly and you won't have these bad days. So because the brain does have multiple fuels, then that is also a myth. Myth number three is that this blood sugar is only a problem as we age. And again, it's easy to see where this comes from because the majority of people over 65 have poor blood sugar handling or are even diabetic, but it doesn't mean it doesn't start earlier. And because of so many different factors that we didn't have a hundred years ago, such as an abundance of processed foods, we have guidelines that tell us to eat almost all carbohydrates. 
We have more sedentary lifestyles. We live more with computers, we're busier, we don't move, we don't go outside. And we have more snacks. There's more snack availability, plus we're told that we have to eat them to top off our blood sugar. And some other relatively new factors like seed oils that promote insulin resistance and metabolic disease, as well as overeating because everything has chemical additives and chemical flavorings that trick the brain into eating more than we normally should. So for all these reasons, it doesn't take so long to break your metabolism anymore. And as a result, we're seeing metabolic disease, blood sugar problems, type 2 diabetes going further and further down in ages until we have it a lot in the teens and even in preteens. So type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, but that's not so much the case. Even though it mostly affects the elderly, it, it more and more it's affecting all ages. So again, it's a myth that we shouldn't worry about it till we're older. Myth number four is that all different types of sugar are pretty much the same. They affect the blood sugar the same way. So there's two issues we have to understand here. One is the glycemic index, which is basically a measurement of how quickly something that we eat raises blood sugar. And then related to that is glycemic load, which basically just says how much of that thing are you eating? And anything that drives up blood sugar is going to create an insulin response and over time create insulin resistance. And once we have insulin resistance, that means the body is resisting the action of insulin, which is to help the glucose into the cell. So with insulin resistance, the sugar can't get out of the bloodstream as well. And now blood sugar levels rise and insulin levels rise because the body thinks it has to produce more and more insulin to handle this glucose that the cells don't want anymore. But there's also a second mechanism that has to do with a fatty liver a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's a different mechanism, but it turns out to be even stronger in terms of producing insulin resistance and metabolic disease. And here is why sugars affect the body very differently. So if we start off with what's called a disaccharide, which means that there are two glucose molecules linked up with a bond. So a monosaccharide would be just one ring, two rings would be a disaccharide. And if both of these are glucose, then this is something we call maltose. That's the name of that sugar. And this has a glycemic index of 105. So that's interesting that one of these, which goes out almost instantly, has a glycemic index of 100. But when they're linked up, then for some reason in the body, that produces an even higher glycemic index, an even faster blood sugar response. So where does maltose come from? Is that something we eat a lot? Well, if you've heard of starch, if you've heard of complex carbohydrates, that is what that is. If we link these rings together, glucose by glucose, if we link them by the hundreds or by the thousands, they're called starch. And as soon as you eat that rice or that bread, you start chopping off little units of these huge chains. And this happens very quickly in terms of minutes. And when we chop off a two ring unit, that's called maltose, this is exactly what we're getting and we have a glycemic response that's very, very high from this. But we don't have to change a whole lot. If this ring stays the same, but this ring becomes something called galactose, now this sugar is called lactose. So the first ring is the same, that's glucose, but the second ring is different. Instead of glucose, it's something called galactose. Now, this blood sugar response slows down dramatically. We're down to 45, which is much, much slower. So it's still a sugar and we shouldn't overload on lactose either, especially if we're sensitive to 
lactose if we don't have the enzyme to break it down. But this sugar is very, very different even though on the surface it looks very similar. The next sugar is the one we really want to understand. So if we have this same first ring being glucose, but the second ring is fructose. Now this is table sugar, sucrose. And the problem here is that this fructose behaves very, very differently. The glucose in all of these will tend to raise blood sugar, but to different degrees. However, this fructose does not raise blood sugar very much, but it has the same effect on the liver pretty much, really close, as what alcohol does. Because fructose and alcohol can only be processed by the liver. So the tendency to overload the liver is very, very high. So if you drink a half a bottle of whiskey every day, then that alcohol is basically going to plug up the liver. But the same thing happens if you drink a bunch of sugar. If you eat sugar, if you drink sugar, if you eat high fructose corn syrup or drink high fructose corn syrup, the same thing happens because this fructose is going to overload your liver. It's going to create a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and move your whole metabolic disease toward insulin resistance. So these are called disaccharides, and we can't absorb these the way they are. We need to break this bond with an enzyme, a maltase, lactase, sucrase. However, once we have broken it, now these are called monosaccharides. So again, if we break these so they're floating around by themselves, now they're monosaccharides, and now we basically have what's called high fructose corn syrup. And if we have glucose by itself, the glycemic index is 100. If we have fructose by itself, it is about 25. And that's why sucrose or table sugar has a glycemic index of 65. It kind of sits in the middle. However, high fructose corn syrup, because these are floating around freely, we don't have to break that bond first, so this gets out even faster, and the glucose goes straight into the bloodstream at a number 100, and the fructose goes to the liver and clogs it up. So basically, from an insulin resistance and liver health standpoint, we need to understand that glucose is bad because it drives insulin, but fructose is worse. Now, fructose exists in table sugar and in high fructose corn syrup and also in all fruits and in all juices but it doesn't exist in starch so if you eat rice or potato it doesn't get in from there and also in milk it's a different sugar so we don't get fructose from those and that's why we need to be especially careful with things that come with table sugar high fructose corn syrup and from fruit and especially juices. So how bad these are depends on how much fructose they have. So most high fructose corn syrup is about 55% fructose. That's why it's called high. But it starts already at 42. So that's not really high fructose. That's kind of low fructose corn syrup. But it's still bad because you have the glucose to raise blood sugar and you have the fructose to clog the liver. And this can go all the way up to 90% of fructose. And then there are natural things like honey. And even though honey has some benefits and it has some other things in there, it basically consists entirely of glucose and fructose. So it has about four parts fructose to three parts glucose. On average, it depends on what kind of bees make it and where they reside and so forth. But for all intents and purposes, honey is just a high fructose syrup. That's what it is in terms of blood sugar. Now that's not all bad because the glycemic index of honey is really low. And if you're insulin sensitive, if you don't need to avoid carbohydrates very strictly, then honey would be a better source of sugar because it's natural, and because it has a very low glycemic index. And if you're not insulin resistant, then a small amount of fructose is not going to hurt you. It hurts you 
when the doses start becoming toxic, which unfortunately they have become for most of the population. And another very common misconception is agave, which is basically cactus syrup. They make tequila from that. And agave is another high fructose syrup. It can go anywhere from about 55% and all the way up to 90%. So even though, again, the glycemic index is relatively low, if you are insulin resistant, if you have a fatty liver, then this is the last thing that you want. So again, sugars are very different, so this is clearly a myth. Myth number five is that orange juice would somehow be healthy and a good food for diabetics and people with blood sugar handling problems because it's natural. Well, if you understand what we talked about, that it doesn't matter if it occurs naturally in the food or if it's in white sugar. Once we turn it into juice, that juice, that sugar is available just as fast or faster than sugar. You understand that it doesn't matter if it's added sugar or not. It's still that same sugar. And juices have 50% glucose, 50% fructose. It's going to give or take plus minus 5% depending on the fruit, but these are basically all the sugars that are in there. You're getting glucose and fructose no matter what. So that is another huge myth. Number six is that small frequent meals would help blood sugar. Now, I guess you could say that's true if by that you mean that it helps raise blood sugar, but of course that's the last thing that you want. So what this really does, what frequent meals do, is that they perpetuate a dependence on carbohydrate and they perpetuate unstable blood sugar, a blood sugar roller coaster. And again, it's not rocket science that if you have, if you eat something and it raises blood sugar and then you release some insulin and it brings it down, and then you've trained your body to eat carbohydrate every couple of hours, then every time your blood sugar drops a little bit, you're going to get hungry, you're going to get a craving because you trained your body into doing that. And if you eat small frequent meals, then your blood sugar is going to go like this throughout the day. And every time blood sugar is down, you're going to reinforce this dependency on carbohydrate. You're going to want to have something to eat all the time that your blood sugar drops a little bit. And along those lines, we also often hear that it is dangerous, it's bad for you, or even dangerous to skip a meal or to do some fasting, because then what would happen is you couldn't function apparently when your blood sugar dropped a little bit. And I get it. That's why there are so few humans left on the planet, because Every time that they had a pizza party and they forgot to save some for the morning after, then they just wiped out. They didn't have any energy when they woke up, so they couldn't go and find more food. And I'm joking, of course, we function often even better when we start breaking down some fat and making some ketones. Very often, the mind and the brain sharpens so that we can be more effective in going out and finding that food. Now, they do have a slight point. There is one category of people where it can be dangerous to skip a meal. And that is if you are on insulin therapy. So this would be primarily a type one diabetic. So if you're on an insulin pump, for example, that dishes out insulin, so you eat something and the insulin pump automatically kicks out insulin, but then you don't eat again and it kicks out some more insulin now that blood sugar could hit dangerously low levels because you're not fat adapted. You don't have any ketones. And now when the blood sugar goes low, you become truly hypoglycemic and you can go into a coma because of low blood sugar. Theoretically, that could happen to a type 2 diabetic, but it would be much, much harder because even if you're on insulin, you already have too much insulin. So adding a little bit more isn't going to make a dramatic difference because your cells are so resistant to that insulin. So you might drop down a little bit below what you're used to, 
but it would probably not reach dangerous levels. So that's another myth. Small frequent meals help perpetuate the imbalance and the problem. Myth number seven is that complex carbohydrates help control blood sugar. Now let's look at a few different foods. If we compare sugar, white bread, and whole wheat bread, because we hear all the time that sugar is terrible, you should limit that, white bread's not so great, but whole wheat is the best thing that you could eat. You should eat as much brown rice and whole wheat bread and complex carbs as possible. But let's see how they actually impact blood sugar. So sugar, table sugar, sucrose, has a glycemic index of 65. White bread is quite a bit worse, meaning it raises blood sugar faster at 75. And then whole wheat, which is supposed to be so much better, is 74. So like just over 1% better, which is minuscule. So from a blood sugar perspective, there is no difference. There is no significant difference. Yes, one has a little bit of fiber. It has a few more minerals and vitamins. But if we're looking to handle and control blood sugar, there really is no difference. And yet, these recommendations are on every official site, every list, every agency that you can find. And so often it's that we can't get away from the idea of what we're supposed to eat. And we think that what we've been eating for the last 30 years is what it has to be. It has to be all this bread and pasta and rice and processed foods and so on. But very often it's simply that wheat, whole wheat, is a little better than something else. So yeah, it is insignificantly better than white bread. And sure, I would agree that it's better than jelly beans. It is better than Coca-Cola. It is better than donuts, but it doesn't make it good. What we need to eat are things like meat and nuts and eggs and low starch vegetables, leafy greens, avocados, and things like that, because their glycemic index runs in the single digits or in the teens. So those are foods that truly will control blood sugar, but you have to shift your mind and understand that you can actually eat those things. That's what our ancestors used to eat. Myth number seven, better than does not mean good. Myth number eight is that protein does not affect blood sugar. So we have to understand what the purpose of protein is. First of all, it can only do two things. And number one is to become a building block. As you want to make new tissues, as you wear out different body parts and you make new cells, then protein is needed for those replacement parts. But anything that doesn't become tissue, any protein you eat that does not turn into building blocks and tissue, is excess, it's extra, it's left over, and it will be turned into glucose. You can't store protein other than in the tissue. So if it doesn't become tissue, it will become glucose. Now this is very, very insignificant amount and speed compared to eating sugar or carbohydrate. But we still need to point it out to understand that this is how it works and therefore, if you're really, really trying to be strict with the protein, with, with your blood sugar, then you should not eat excess protein. You should not load up on protein just because you think it has zero impact. And you know this to be true because on your blood test is something called BUN, blood urea nitrogen. And this nitrogen is the residue from the protein. As we turn the amino acid into glucose, there's a nitrogen residue that ends up in the bloodstream. So if you eat a huge excess of protein, then your bun is going to go up. But the next thing to understand is that most protein in nature comes packaged with fat. So a lot of people who eat carnivore, they understand this. People who only eat animal products, they don't necessarily eat all that much protein. So if you, for example, if you eat a juicy steak or some ground beef that has what they call 80% lean, 20% fat, then the calorie distribution 
is actually 27% of calories from protein and 73 from fat. So even someone who is carnivore that you think they often tell you and, and people often think that they eat nothing but protein and yet it's almost three quarters of their energy from fat, which is a good stable fuel source. So even eating nothing but meat, these people probably still don't overload or don't overload very much on protein. So it's a myth that protein has no impact on blood sugar, but the impact is not very large unless you were to eat huge amounts. If you really try to focus on getting a lot of protein from lean sources like chicken breast, now it is quite easy to overload on protein. And then we get into the medical handling of these issues. And this is where we really need to understand how harmful these myths are. Myth number nine is that type two diabetes would be best detected and managed by measuring glucose and A1C. So what does that mean? If we run a very common blood test, glucose is on virtually every blood test, and I think it should be, then the lab range says it should be between 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, which for the average person means you have about three to four grams of glucose floating around in your bloodstream at any given time. And not as common, but it is getting pretty common and something that absolutely need to be on a blood test is hemoglobin A1C, which they say should be below 5.7. And hemoglobin A1C is simply a protein in your red blood cell, in your hemoglobin. And the more sugar that you have in the bloodstream at any given time, the more sugar is going to stick to that protein in the red blood cell. And the average red blood cell lives about 100 days. So by measuring how much sugar is stuck as a percentage, we get a rough estimate, a pretty good estimate of what the glucose is over a hundred day period. And both of these are very inexpensive and simple. I think they should be on every blood test, but glucose fluctuates all the time and we don't get a whole lot of information from it. A1C is a much better marker, but still has huge limitations, which will talk about in a second. Now, I believe that a healthy glucose should be more so in the 80s. I think by the time you're creeping up toward 100, there's already an issue. And if you're doing fasting or a ketogenic diet, then it's okay for it to drop below the 80s. Your A1C, I think, should be below 5.4, 5.3, somewhere around that. By the time it's 5.7, you're already very close to pre-diabetic and you have some significant momentum going in the wrong direction. So those two need to be on every blood test, but here's why it's a grave mistake to rely on those two alone. Let's say that you start off with a normal blood glucose and then while you are healthy, it takes a certain amount of insulin, which is also a healthy level to control that. And then let's say that a few years go by and you check it again and your glucose is normal once more. But if they only measure glucose and A1C, then they're gonna get the glucose, which is instantaneous. They're gonna get the A1C, which is a 100 day average. But here's the point. Both of those markers, glucose and A1C, are controlled variables. The body works very, very hard at keeping it down, like we've talked about throughout here. High blood sugar is an emergency. The body starts counteracting it within minutes because it's dangerous. If you were to absorb that entire meal of carbohydrate, even if it's just 30, 40 grams, and you did not get any blood sugar out, you would be in a coma before that meal was absorbed. So sugar, blood sugar is a controlled variable. So let's say that five years later, it, the blood sugar is still controlled at that level, but it takes two to three times more insulin to control it. Now, if we only measure glucose and A1C, we won't find it. But if we measure insulin, we'll see, hey, this is 
this is changing. Something is increasing here. We wait another five years, glucose is still normal. It's probably still right in, in this range right here. But now that insulin is up fivefold. So the point here is that because it's controlled, we can't notice a difference. We can't find anything on that marker until the body has failed to control it. So the, basically, the whole system has to be broken. Your carbohydrate tolerance machine has to break before we can see any changes on those two markers. So then five years later again, now we see that it's gone over 100. So it's gone from, let's say, 90 to 120. And now your A1C is probably around 6 and your insulin is probably sky high. So if we understand you can't measure, you can't rely on a marker on a variable that is so tightly regulated because glucose is going to change like this and only change when the body fails. Whereas if we measure insulin, which is the thing controlling it, we're going to see an almost linear change. So this is a huge and harmful myth and perhaps one of my biggest pet peeves with anything about diabetes and blood sugar handling. And myth number 10 is equally harmful and a grave mistake. And that says that all we have to do to treat diabetes and blood sugar problems is to control the blood sugar. But blood sugar is not one problem, it's two problems. That one obviously is the high blood sugar, but the second one is the high insulin. And when we have chronically high insulin, we have what's called insulin resistance. The insulin isn't working, so the body makes more. The cells are resisting, so the body makes even more, and so on and so on. And this leads to metabolic disease, metabolic syndrome. And this is the number one cause of all the things that kill people. 95% of degenerative disease is related to these factors. So we have cardiovascular disease, we have stroke, we have dementia, cancer, high blood pressure, and the list goes on and on. And it is about insulin resistance and metabolic disease. But here's why this myth number 10 is so dangerous. As we become more insulin resistant, over time the insulin increases until we get to a point where the cells are so insulin resistant that even this huge amount of insulin doesn't keep the blood sugar under control. So the thinking now is the body isn't making enough insulin, let's add some more. So even though your body has all this insulin produced by itself, they add exogenously, they inject it. So now when you add even more insulin, then for a while you will control blood glucose you have the desired effect of lowering blood glucose a little bit. So you're handling problem number one to a degree, but the other problem is that you are increasing insulin resistance. The bigger problem, you're making it worse by adding this additional insulin. These people already have too much insulin and we're adding more. So we're making them sicker. We're lowering their blood glucose at the expense of their health. So the better solution and the only solution is to address the root cause. And the root cause is that you have eaten more carbohydrate than your body can tolerate. That doesn't mean you ate more carbohydrate then the next guy, it just means you ate too much for you. You broke your carbohydrate tolerance machine. And if we cut back on the sugar and the carbohydrate and the frequency of meals and all the things that raise insulin, now we will address both of these. We will lower both the blood glucose and the insulin resistance. And if you think that sounds too simple to just lower carbs and address the root cause, then you're 
in good company. Most people never give that a try because they've heard too many of these myths and they haven't met enough people or they, it seems too far-fetched that you could fix it by yourself that easily. Now, realize it doesn't work 100%, but it works probably around 95 to 98%. And if I were you, then I would take those odds and run with it and give it a try, you see what happens, and then you learn as much as you can about this. If you happen to be in the few percent where it doesn't solve it, then you really need to understand why and figure out what's going on. And for those of you who want to dive a little deeper in figuring out how to catch things early, I've created a blood work course and you can find some more information on that down below. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.